Welcome to this program. My name is Michelle Singer. I'm the Adult Programs Coordinator at the Kellogg Hubbard Library. It's also my privilege to be the coordinator of Poem City, which is this program is part of Poem City. Poem City is a program of the Kellogg Hubbard Library that's a celebration of National Poetry Month. And we do uh, lots of programming. We put uh, almost 400 poems in 100 venues in downtown Montpelier. And we have one of the best festivals of poetry, I think, anywhere. I'm a little biased, but I still think I'm a little biased. <laughs> so we're so happy to have Jack Mayer with us tonight to get us kicked off for Poem City. And I'm going to read an, um, an introduction of Jack, which I think very few of you need. But I'm going to um, I'm going to introduce you anyway. So Dr. Jack Mayer is a Vermont writer and pediatrician. His was the first pediatric practice in Eastern Franklin County on the Canadian border, where he began writing essays, poems, and short stories about his practice and hiking Vermont's long trail. He was a country doctor for 10 years, often bartering medical care for eggs, firewood, and knitted Afghans. From 1987 to 1991, Dr. Mayer was a National Cancer Institute fellow at Columbia University, researching the molecular biology of cancer. Dr. Mayer established Rainbow Pediatrics in Middlebury, Vermont in 1991, where he continues to practice primary care pediatrics. He's an instructor in pediatrics at the University of Vermont School of Medicine and an adjunct faculty for pre-medical students at Middlebury College. He was a participant at the Bread Loaf Writers Conference in 2003 and 2005 in fiction and 2008 in poetry. His first nonfiction book is Life in a Jar, the Irina Sendler Project. His new book, Before the Court of Heavens, Heaven, is historical fiction about the rise of Nazism and has received 14 book awards. His collection of poems, which he's gonna read from tonight, is inspired and composed in wilderness, poems from the wilderness, and won the Proverse Prize 2019 in international literary competition. We're so happy to have you here, Dr. Jack Mayer, tonight as part of Poem City. Welcome. Thank you. And, and thank you all for, for being Zoom, Zoom buddies with me tonight. This is, this is, this is great. I, I wanna thank Michelle for organizing this and thank the Kellogg Hubbard Library for sponsoring, uh, sponsoring my presentation tonight and, and for the marvelous work they do with Palm City. It's really a remarkable project. And I've been lucky enough to have some of my poems displayed for Palm City in the past and um, I look forward to that in the future too. Um, I also want to just give a shout out to my publisher who may join us on this Zoom call, um, Jillian Bickley of Proverse Publishing in Hong Kong, um, and my great appreciation for her assistance and encouragement. And I'm really glad to see Susan Jeffs here, who is um, who was the uh, editor from for this collection and is a talented and wonderful poet in her own in her own right. So thank thank you, Susan, and I'm I'm really glad you're here to share this. That's wonderful. So I um, I, I want to start with just two epigraphs for tonight's um, presentation, and the the first one is um, is by Gary Snyder, who is a poet and. Um, he's, he has been referred to as the, the, the Poet Laureate of Deep Ecology. Um, he's a Pulitzer Prize winner. Um, and he said, nature is not a place, it is home. And the second epigraph is by John Muir, who is often called the father of the national parks. He was a, a, a Scottish American nat naturalist author and an uh, early advocate for the preservation of wilderness. And we owe uh, at least partially our national park system to uh, John Muir's efforts. Um, so I, I wanna start with a little personal, personal story about myself and where, where I have come, how I have come to be connected with wilderness adventures. Um, I grew up in New York City. I grew up in a tough neighborhood in the Bronx. Uh, was the Marble Hill Project. Um, I, I lived in what's called now Green Desert, which is um, basically where there is no, no park, no natural life, no trees, no shrubs, nothing. It was really a cement jungle in New York City. Um, and I never really felt either safe or whole in, that, in my childhood um, uh, neighborhood and environment. But the one oasis in this 
in, in this cement desert was the nearby Fort Tryon Park where the cloisters are. The cloisters are, a, uh, it's a medieval monastery and museum, part of the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Um, and um, it has, there, there are spectacular views from the, the, the monastery and from the park across the Hudson River to New Jersey's Palisade Park. Um, my parents would take my brother and, and me there regularly. And, and it was there that I felt the most safe and the most alive. And I attribute that to this, this spot of nature in New York City. Um, and um, I, when I was about eight years old, my uncle Eric, who was a, uh, an avid hiker and skier, invited me to come with, with him and his family to go hiking in the Catskill Mountains, which I, which I did. Um, and it was the most remarkable and wonderful experience for me. And I continued to hike with, with my uncle Eric uh, for a long time. And he was really the one who led, who opened the door for me into the forest. And um, I owe a great debt of gratitude to him. Um, what, I, what I'd like to, to do in, um, as a way of sort of uh, maybe bookmarking my, my life and the association with wilderness is to um, start with, with that eight-year-old boy who went into the Catskills with his uncle for the first time. Um, and so this is a poem called A Boy is Missing. A boy is missing, I'm on his trail. There is no alarm clock to wake me to propel me by internal combustion over asphalt, sidewalks, deadlines into my extinct future. Only a faint trail, white blazes suggesting north or south or sanctuary, the next water source, last year's leaf mulch. The boy I'm tracking down, the boy whose trail I follow has been missing for so long that I scarcely remember his favorite flannel shirt, his buck teeth and brill cream stiff hair. Mile by mile, I draw closer, glimpse him through autumn foliage. My hands and face are unwashed. I carry soil into my tent with neither worry nor culpability and sleep the phantasmagorical sleep of one newly born or one who has passed over. Don't call me, there is no phone. Don't send me to bed, there is no bed. Don't fill my plate with boiled Brussels sprouts or illusions I must swallow if I want dessert. I won't ever find that missing boy, but searching unbundles my soul. And I'd like to bookmark this with um, a, a, a poem from the from my perspective now as an as an elder hiker and elder participant in wilderness and um, this is called gratitude thank you wilderness my old old friend who upon reunion after my year long absence asks for nothing and gives everything. When we first met, I knew you like a brother. I was eight, you were 3.8 billion. It was my first hike with uncle Eric and his dachshund Bijou in the Catskill mountains. In my early twenties, besotted with you, Zealously adolescent, I nearly froze to death snow camping in the high Sierra near Donner Pass. We have grown closer and older, you and I. You have held me as I slept in my mummy sack. My hiking sticks, once ornamental, are now essential. The sheer tonnage I have hauled to be near you has lightened with miracle fibers. The trail has become my enduring house of worship, stained glass foliage praising forest saints. I am penitent about the privies we humans have built along our pilgrimage route, clumsy, crude confessionals for a communion of sorts. Someday soon, we'll share a park bench 
you and I on a sunny autumn day. Tears will blur because soon I will leave you and I will say thank you again. <clears throat> um, so when I when I walk into the woods alone, I pass through this thin, invisible membrane into wilderness. The ex the experience of this really transcends my any perceptions I have of reality, and the ordinary becomes consecrated. As I, my, my habit in, in walking alone in wilderness is to compose a poem um, while I'm hiking. And then I leave that first draft, I, I transcribe it into the shelter book at, the, uh, at one of the lean-to shelters along the trail. Um, and I sign each poem with my trail name, which is Mountain Poet. Um, it feels like sort of an act of guerrilla poetry uh, written under my nom de plume. And an interesting thing about trail names is that most, most hikers assume a trail name. It's kind of a chosen identity for wilderness. Um, tra trail names are funny, they're poignant, they're profound, they're uh, metaphorical, um, and sometimes just weird. Um, trail names honor the otherness of wilderness, this other dimension of our personalities. We relinquish our given names and take this trail name and it's an identity one can change any time. Um, this next, um, so if, if this next poem um, I, I wrote after meeting these two 16 year olds on the trail. Um, and th this particular poem I left at the David Logan shelter, um, but uh, they, uh, they were hiking, Nathan and Lydia were hiking on, on the long trail together and had been out for a couple of days and they, boy, did they, they smelled like they'd been out for a couple of days, kind of like a gym locker room with, with a lot of adolescent pheromones and, um, but they were a lovely, lovely uh, pair. Um, and we, we talked for a long time and it got me thinking about trail names and you'll, you'll hear why. Trail names. Near as I can tell, no one reads these poems, which is just as well. I am free to hand scribe each one like a scruffy, sweaty monk in service to sanctity. I imagine my poems stacked like cordwood in the long trail warehouse with every shelter journal, every trail name. Rusted root has through hiked the long Appalachian and Pacific crest trails, mostly alone. He points to his pack, Tina Turner. Sometimes I get lonely. Mops and Pops have run 76 marathons. They're pushing 60. Mops binds her feet with duct tape. Pops' stories are all about running. Lydia and Nathan went to grade school together. Still in high school, Lydia is waiting for her trail name. Nathan is Scooter, but the dreadlocked boy smiles sweetly and says, I'm not Scooter anymore. How curious to carry so many names, dad, doc, honey, mountain poet, pilgrim. We dare to choose our trail names, dare to hike our long trail, leaving our old names behind. So with my hiking, sometimes I hike alone. Sometimes I, um, I, I hike with others. Most often I hike with my son, Alex, who is here, Alex Mayer, right next to me in the Zoom screen. Um, and um, I, I actually have this, uh, the, the dedication on, on, this, on the, the bo this book of poetry is, for my son, Alex, my fellow wilderness traveler. So Alex is from Rhode Island. His trail name is Lil Rhodey. So what is it about hiking alone in wilderness? Um, and I think here of the concept of mindfulness, which I, um, I define as a moment to moment, non-judgmental awareness. 
the quality of alone time in wilderness is unique and it's mysterious. There is no conversation. My monkey mind is taking a nap. Um, I disconnect from stresses, strains, successes, and failures of life in the flatlands. My, the, the soundscape is of wind and water, bird song, uh, the, the crunch of my boots on the trail. My mind is uncluttered. I make it my intention to be available to the mystery, to the essence, the healing of wilderness. There are no words. I access different parts of my brain and different parts of my soul. And usually a poem emerges. So I, I, I wanna talk a little bit now about this notion of a wilderness effect and what is this strange thing we call the wilderness effect. Um, and I wanna start by thinking about how we have viewed nature over the millennia. And um, for the first several thousand years of civilization, we, uh, we viewed our, uh, relation, our relationship through, a, through a, an evolving series of, um, of lenses. Um, and the first one being this, the concept of dominion, which is sovereignty or control. And it's kind of a biblical lens that we, um, where God's injunction is for humans to use the earth and its flora and fauna for, fauna for mankind's benefit. That has evolved maybe over the last 150 or so years into this notion of stewardship, which is supervising or taking care of nature. And now I would, I would uh, say that we have evolved further into the notion of partnership. Um, and I think that's because our natural world has become so distressed. So we have climate change, we have pollution, we have pandemics. We understand the crucial need now for biodiversity, for interdependence. We are in fact one with nature. Um, to reflect a little bit about our, our current pandemic, there's a sad irony here. Um, pandemics emerge from wilderness. And I noticed that just today, the World Health Organization team that was evaluating the origins of the COVID-19 virus have concluded um, that this, uh, this virus came from uh, our interaction with, with the natural world. Um, if we abuse the wilderness, we invite pandemics. Um, at the same time, and the irony here is that we need the natural world for us to be healthy, happy, creative, relaxed. Somehow we have to simultaneously hold both the, the threat and the benefit um, from our interaction with nature. We must relearn how to interact with, not be separate from the natural world. Um, we humans have upset the balance and boundaries of the natural world. Um, it, viruses break out of their wilderness reservoirs and infect humans. Bats are the source of COVID-19. Um, chimpanzees, source of HIV, bats and civet cats uh, are the source of the, our first COVID epidemic about a little more than 10 years ago, the SARS COVID-1, um, Ebola. Uh, these viruses crossed over to humans who violated the natural boundaries between species. So it's, it's well known that the health of wildlife and the health of ecosystems and the health and, and human health are all inextricably linked Encounters with novel pathogens occur when we eat wild animals, capture and mix wild species together in these so-called wet markets um, and destroy wilderness, for instance, through, uh, through uh, deforestation, uh, which removes the natural uh, buffers and increases interactions with wild animals. And this is where pandemics begin. So as, as long as there is profit to be made from wildlife marketing and trading, from mining, from resource extraction, um, we will see more of these uh, pandemics. We have fractured our relationship with wild nature as if we are somehow separate from and immune from its consequences. Um, this year we learned that we are neither separate nor immune. If we protect natural systems, 
they will protect us. If we violate them, inevitably we get pandemics and climate change and species collapse and extinctions. But what happens when we go into wilderness gently and mindfully? Since, uh, since about the 1970s, there has been this growing scientific literature about the so-called wilderness effect and investigators have created this new field of, of study called eco-psychology. Um, so here's a, one definition of the wilderness effect. Uh, it's the beneficial effects that exposure to the natural world has on health, reducing stress and promoting healing. The wilderness effect is a manifestation of the human need for nature. We intuitively understand the concept but we now have, uh, have evidence, have hard evidence for, for this relationship. Um, so the research has been going on for about 50 years, but in the last 20 years, there's been a real, ex real increase and explosion in the number of studies that have been done and published in peer reviewed, uh, reviewed scientific journals. Um, in 2005, a book came out called The Last Child in the Woods. And it was by Richard Louvre, who's a, a um, San Diego-based journalist who writes for the New York Times and the Washington Post. Um, and he has, his, this book is largely credited with popularizing the notion of the, this wilderness effect. And he termed, he, he coined the term nature deficit disorder, um, which he defined as the, the stress central nervous system arousal and instability, immune system dysfunction, impaired self-esteem, anxiety, and mood disturbances. In 2005, when he wrote this book, he could identify only 60 studies that had been done that were, were valuable and were, were worthy of, of quoting. Uh, now that number has surpassed 1,000. And they all point in one direction, which is that nature is not only nice to have, but for physical health and for our cognitive functioning, it is a have to have. Um, at the Outward Bound program, which takes, uh, takes people into wilderness and has special programs for, uh, for challenged young people, um, uh, they, they have studied the effect of wilderness on these, uh, on, on teenagers and adolescents who are taken out into wilderness. Um, and they, what they find is a significant blunting of um, aggression, uh, increase in focus and attention, um, improved community building, compassion, and empathy. So how much wilderness is enough? That question has been asked. And um, the, there's a general consensus that there, there, seems, there seems to be a threshold of about two hours a week that is the amount of time that and, and it can be spread out to, you know, to over seven days, it doesn't have to be two hours all at once. Um, but that's associated with good health and well-being. The, um, so this nature deficit disorder that I talked about, um, it, this is, it's um, the, when we go into wilderness in a mindful way, um, we find that wilderness is an antidote for this nature deficit disorder. It's an antidote for stress, um, been demonstrated to lower blood pressure, to, uh, to decrease the amount of stress hormones that, that are circulating, uh, reduces nervous system arousal, it enhances our immune system function, and it increases self-esteem, reduces anxiety, and improves and stabilizes mood. Um, the forest is really the therapist. And, uh, you know, at, in, in the latter part of my career as a physician, I also found myself really prescribing wilderness to families as a therapeutic intervention for them. Um, now, we cannot rely on only experiencing wilderness visually. So you can't sit there and watch the forest on a television. That doesn't do, that doesn't work. Um, it has to be an immersive phenomenon. Um, and we benefit most from wilderness when we interact with it um, with humility, with childlike fascination, and employ all of our, um, all of our senses. Um, a lot of the research on the wilderness effect has come from Japan and Japanese researchers um, call the, the, their term for the wilderness effect is 
Shinrin Yoku, which translates as forest bathing. Um, and it's a poetic name for walking in the woods. Um, this forest bathing and forest therapy broadly means taking in with all of one's senses the forest atmosphere. It's not simply a walk in the woods. It's a conscious practice, a contemplative practice of being immersed in the sights, the sounds, the smells, the taste and the feel of the forest. Uh, several hypotheses that have been advanced about how this might work suggest that um, th there are various aerosols that are released by trees and, and, and shrubbery and uh, a, a, a lot of fauna releases these aerosols that, um, and, and that these might be the, uh, the, the vehicle as they're inhaled in the woods for elevating and that's have been demonstrated to elevate the levels of, of these uh, certain critical uh, lymphocytes that called the, the NK or natural killer cells in our immune system. And these are the cells that fight tumors and, and infections. Um, anxiety over climate change, so no, sort of another phenomenon that has been growing and um, particularly affects also young people and adolescents. Um, I've heard more than one of my one of my patients talk about their concerns about what their life is going to be like given the the, the challenges of climate change, um, and one of the best antidotes for the for climate change anxiety might be um, having more exposure to green spaces. Um, the being in wilderness is also a respite for, from COVID-19, both a respite from not only the pandemic, but from the politics. Um, and wilderness can be seen and then, and, in, and we can enjoy it and take it in as kind of a metaphor in all of its manifestations. It's restorative, it's nurturing, it's inspiring, it's perplexing, it's ineffable, and yes, it's sometimes dangerous. And that's part of the mix. Um, so the, um, the, one of the things that I, that I enjoy m so much about how, what poems emerge from my, my walking in the woods is that, um, is that ordinary things become, become venerated and become, uh, become special. So I, and I, um, I, I want to honor First, a pair of boots. Um, so I, you know, I both sort of appreciate and I take for granted my boots, but I shouldn't. And you'll hear perhaps why. Boots. You must let go of old boots when the soul separates from the leather. Mourn the many miles, the weariness and exultation. These new boots are not yet mine. They have barely six miles on them. So far, so good, no hot spots. I'm still learning how they grip or slip on wet rocks. My old boots sit outside with the trash. I think I'll bury them and mark the grave or plant forget-me-nots in them for one last season. Old friends who have carried me to the lap of God and back. And then um, camp stoves, this, this is a, a memorial poem for a camp stove that I had that blew up rather spectacularly when, in the woods on one of my, one of my trips. Um, I actually have, I think I'm gonna indulge your patience for one second so I can actually get the stove and show it to you because it's it needs to be honored in that way. <laughs> Hang on. This is a good moment to say that if you have questions, you're welcome to put them in the chat. Although I think at the end of the reading, we'll also be able to unmute and ask questions ourselves in person. But if you have a question before that, you want to put it in the chat, you're welcome to. And the other note is that this is being recorded. So if you know somebody who wasn't able to be here, it will be available on the Kellogg Cupboard Library website, adult programs page. 
All right, here it is. Here it is. This is the stove. It's made by Svea, S-V-E-A. It's a Swedish stove. Um, I, this worked for me for about 40 years and then it just blew up. Um, um, so this is, and I, I, I kept it, I keep it in, the, in a very special place, which you'll hear about. This is called In Memoriam Svia Camp Stove. And I left this poem at the Suckerbrook shelter on the long trail. It rained hard yesterday at Middlebury Gap. Deep footprints in the mud will soon enough disappear. The ridge line is enhanced with morning mist, pines blurred by fog. My old friend died last night, my Svea camp stove, whom I have lit for 40 years. She perished in explosive flames. Svea and I have had good times, snow camping in the high Sierras with my girlfriend, our hot bodies warming us, our kisses desperate in the valley of death. Svea and I have had bad times, snow camping in the high Sierras with my girlfriend near Donner Pass, where snowbound starving humans in 1846 cannibalized each other in desperation. We almost died of hypothermia and exhaustion when Svea was new and I was 20 something. She was brass plated like gold. I was always glad to see her before a camping trip or just winking at me for no reason from her basement shelf. Maybe there are but a few years left for me to leave a footprint in the wilderness. I shall miss it as much as breathing. I'll keep dearly departed Svea on that shelf like an urn holding cremated ashes and we'll wink at each other, my companion in the wilderness or the basement darkness. Um, so another, another bit of ordinary It, this is in, this poem is inspired by my bird feeder, and I, I, I'm thinking of it today because it's it's time to take the bird food down so the bears don't get it. And a friend of mine already had a bear visit their bird feeder, um, but um, I I've been inspired over the years just by watching watching the birds through through that through my window, and um, this. This poem is called, I am a God to the birds. I am a God to the birds flocking to my feeder in winter, a forgiving God who when winter winds bite and summer's bounty is frozen, miraculously provides fishes and loaves, sunflower seeds and suet in exchange for their beauty, their bickering, their blessing. They cannot know how I praise them through the glass, astounded that they can fly and I cannot. That for them, fear is so ordinary, so transcendent that they proclaim the glory. When the winter, when, when the winter of my soul chills, when the fruits of summer are exhausted, I turn to holy books to peck at their words for seeds of truth for sustenance, for exaltation. I revel in the mystery, the prayer, that a God behind the window loves me enough to feed my soul. So another, uh, uh, another fascination I have, which, which finds its way into my poetry is, um, is with uh, with uh, physics and the intersection of the of the physical world and the metaphysical world, um, with um, you know thinking about uh, about sort of classical physics with you know subatomic particles and quantum mechanics and dark matter and dark energy, um, time and space, 
and then putting that in in uh, in companion with metaphysics, with uh, those abstract concepts of being, of knowing, of substance, of causality, of identity, and again of time and space. Um, the, the physicists all tell us that time, and, and Einstein was very clear about this. He said, time is a, is a stubbornly persistent illusion that there, we have, um, we're, we're kind of grounded on our, in our linear perception of time, um, 60 seconds per minute, but we also experience and, and we know the elasticity of time. You go to sleep and seven hours, eight hours passes in, in no time. Um, you sit through a boring lecture and, um, and 60 minutes can seem like it takes forever. Um, in fact, clocks on the top of mountains run faster than clocks in the valley. So, and uh, clocks in, in, on a satellite run quite a bit faster than clocks on earth. Um, so there, there is, this is a, there, there's an elasticity here. There's a, there's a funkiness to our concepts of time. Um, I, I have these photographs of, uh, they're collage photographs of my parents, one for my mother and one for my father um, at various ages hanging on the wall in my, in my house. Um, and it was looking at these two, two collages that inspired um, this one of my physics poems, which is called a stubbornly persistent illusion. Um, and the actual quote from Einstein, I, I include, I included that as uh, appended that to the poem it, and it's um, the way Einstein put it was a distinction between the past, present and future is only a stubbornly persistent illusion. The stubbornly persistent illusion of time is obvious when I consider the photo collages, when I gaze at my young father and mother from where they live on my wall, patient, constant, faithful. Dad is 20, a full head of dark hair, sitting on a dirt road in Italy, beside his rucksack, puffing a pipe. He stares past the frame, past the smoke of his pipe into 1938, unaware of the looming psychotic break of war. He is 15 years younger than my son. Mom gifts the photographer her Mona Lisa smile as if just informed of her first pregnancy, my brother. I know their crude taxonomy, daddy, Heinz, Harvey, finally dad, mommy, nanny, nana, finally mom, a mere slice of their lives across an ocean of time. What matters is that they are here defying time as long as I notice them. In my orderly synaptic brain, past is mere memory, present, moment to moment elusiveness, everything and nothing, future, infinity, everything possible. How many dimensions do I inhabit? Merrily, 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 life is but a dream from which we cannot awaken. Um, Oh yeah, and then, you know they always when when people talk about Einstein, they always talk about his comments about think, saying that God does not roll dice, that we, we are not living in this um, in this random universe. Um, so um, that I I find that notion very very intriguing and. Um, and there, there's both great mystery and inspiration in that, uh, in that sort of intersection of uh, physics and metaphysics um, and, and even statistics and poetry. So here's, uh, this poem is called Einstein Doubted That God Rolled Dice. Einstein doubted that God rolled dice, his doubt being not faith, but mathematics. Einstein knew 
in the roll of the bones lies elegant order, delicate design, statistical certainty. But I wonder, though we are not privy to the calculus as we fall through our geometric web, if it only seems to us from our relative perspective of falling that God does not care. So the, um, I, it, it, the other notion that I, I really appreciate about our, our understanding of physics, and I find this somewhat amusing, is our efforts to, to formulate this, what's called the grand unified theory of all of the four forces of nature and the attempt by physicists to, to, to basically create another God, which is this grand unified theory that will tell us, it, it, it's the, it's, and it's called, the physicists call it the theory of everything. So it'll tell us about everything that's going on. And, and I, I find that not, not such a humbling thought at all and, and probably will not end well, but, but th there it is out there and they're, they're looking for it. And one of the things that physicists have discovered is that there's this dark matter and dark energy in the world and it in the universe and it comprises about 95% of, of, of what is um, uh, of the universe as, as we know it. And so, and we know almost nothing about this dark matter and dark energy. So if you can wrap your head around this notion that, uh, that in, our, in our scientific surety, we, th there's about only 5% that really we know anything about. Um, the, um, uh, I, I take great solace in the, the first law of thermodynamics, which to me, uh, well, the first law of thermodynamics says that energy, matter, gravity, uh, um, uh, energy, matter, essence can neither be created nor destroyed, only change form. So this to me it, it is reincarnation. Um, every time I go to my compost pile with my food scraps and I dump the compost in the, in, in the bin, and then at the end of the year, pulling beautiful soil out of the bottom of this compost pile. Um, so it gives me great, great hope about um, that we're, we're, not, we're not really going away. We're just recycling. Um, the, um, there's another section in my book of, and there's about 15 poems that, uh, that are under a, a heading called Spirit. Um, and these are poems where questions of faith or, and doubt where um, have, have in, informed the, the, the writing and the, uh, where the poem originates from. Um, and it, just where we belong in the greater scheme of things and, and exploring our religious devotions. Um, the, um, this, this next poem I'm going to read is, is called Prayer Flags. And um, it's, I, I left this at the Swan Song Shelter, which is also sometimes called the Secret Shelter. And this is a shelter that's not, it, it's, it's actually on private land. It's not on the Long Trail. Um, it's about a quarter mile off the Long Trail. And you have to know where it is to get there, which is why it's called the Secret Shelter. And it's the most beautiful campsite that I have ever seen on the Long Trail. Whoever, the people who built this um, structure, the lean-to, beautifully carved wooden supports um, and, it, uh, and, and a, 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 a lovely fire ring and a, um, a privy that is round with, um, with, with mesh at the top. So it lets in air and, and light. Um, and, the, and sitting next to the privy was a magazine rack and it had a, um, uh, a coffee table sized book of the best outhouses in the world. And it's this giant book with these beautiful photographs of all these lovely outhouses. And this outhouse is, is the, the most magnificent, I think that I have ever, ever seen or used. Um, so, um, oh, so, and 
the la and I've, so I've been to this shelter many times on, on hikes. Um, and the last time I went there, um, well, th there had always been a, some prayer flags hung across the front of the lean-to, uh, just on a string, some Tibetan prayer flags. Um, and this time when I went, it, the, the flags had, the, the string had broken, they were just hanging down. They were looking really old and had um, were kind, of, kind of shabby looking. Um, so that generated this, this poem called Prayer Flags. Tattered Tibetan prayer flags hang like wilted flowers from the broken string that once stretched across the lean-to opening. These quilt square sized patches, once brilliant green, red, blue, white, are inscribed in Tibetan script, meant to promote peace, compassion, strength, and wisdom. These are not invocations to gods, but prayers blown by the wind to every creature, every moving particle, every empty space. Our own prayers too hang limply, a bomb against the cruelty, the randomness of fate, the certainty of death and decay. We know too much and not enough. So we build grand cathedrals, synagogues, mosques, and more to secure brief respite, conditional hope. Ultimately, it is for naught these massive walls will one day fall. I retie the prayer flags across the opening. I carefully straighten each one. And then, well, just another sort of measure of how, what the, the devotional feelings that I get being on the, on, on the long trail. Um, this is a very short, short poem. It's called Communion. I am homesick for these woods, anticipating their loss in frailty and death. How humbling to carry everything on my back for no human voice to scatter the sanctity. Today, I am on no quest, seeking only communion in this temple. So I, 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 I wanna end with um, uh, two, two poems. One is one of my doctor poems. I, I, I actually started writing poetry when I was in practice in um, up on the Canadian border in uh, Enosburg Falls and Richford. Um, it, they were inspired by inspired by my patients. Um, and the um, this first one is um, This first one is from a, uh, a house call I made on the Canadian border. It was to a trailer um, to see a child. Um, and it's, the, it's called Blood. After three days hard snow, this border town is ominously picturesque. My snow boots break a path to seven-year-old Rodney who lives in the Charbonneau trailer, completely drifted over on Troy Street the Alberta Clippers Arctic blast across the Canadian border whips my face, whips windows wrapped in plastic, scatters heat like feathers shook loose from geese too lame to migrate. The steel of my stethoscope is a shock on Rodney's chest. His blue rimmed eyes widen, his breath sucks in and in again. I search for shine in his too heavy eyes. What does Rodney know of radiance? Through my black stethoscope, polar winds search empty caves for blood. I must believe that his heart still pumps the energy of creation. 
possibility still suffuses the capillary network of his dreams. But Rodney wears sneakers in the snow and sleeps beside the gas stove that bakes warmth all night to save on fuel oil. He'll grow a few more winters and lose his one-eyed teddy bear. School is canceled, the street muffled by snow until it melts. So an another thing I have uh, I have been doing of late is singing um, along with Mary Jane Washburn right there um, in a hospice singing choir um, and we sing people over we're at our, we're called Wellspring and we are the, the the hospice singing group for Addison County each county I think just about every county has its own hospice singing group and and they're intended to. Um, to be singing over people who are actively dying or in the process of, um, uh, of dying. Um, I'm a bass. Dick, is, oh, let's see, oh, Dick Conrad up here. He's also, he also sings in this, in Wellspring with me and he's a fellow bass. Um, so, um, so th this is called Singing Over. He nears the end of this journey, preparing for the next, breathing coarse, intermittent, body tranquil, but for fitful breath. We stand in a semicircle and sing a hymn, cocoon a man we know because he is one of us and do not know because he approaches the boundary. Small voices in four part harmony fill the dying room a choir suffusing Renaissance heights. I know my part well enough to be present to the mystery, to see myself in his place, to both give and receive this comfort synchronously. Grace made visible, audible, palpable. So I think I'll stop here and um, and um, I wanna thank you for your kind attention. I hope this was a, not a slow hour, but a fast hour um, in, in the realm of time. Um, and, uh, and I'd be happy to, you know, to entertain any questions or comments or that you might have. And, um, and again, thank you very much for your attention. Thank so, you. Uh, Folks are welcome to unmute themselves for questions if they'd like to. If you want to put it in the chat, I'm welcome. I'm, I'm happy to pitch the questions also. I'm putting in the chat um, the website for Poem City or the part of the Kellogg Hubbard Library website that is Poem City so you can see all the programs there. We have some Poem City um, famous people in the audience. We have the Browns here who, um, I don't think that's Thomas I'm looking at, but um, I think Thomas already went somewhere else. But Thomas, this last year, when the when the pandemic started and we were all stuck at home, he invented Poem House. So we we're Poem City, but he invented Poem House and he put it on top of a paper and wrote his poem and posted it in his house. And so this year for Poem City, you can go to our website and you can actually get Poem House in, in the um, in the way that Poem City is stylized and you can do your own Poem House. And that was invented by Thomas Brown. Oh, I didn't know that. I will tell him. It'll be yeah, do. So I, if I'm unmuted now, I did have a question. Go for it. Um, so Jack, you, you write beautifully about hiking and you talk about all the time out long trail and you talked about Gary Snyder. So I'm sure you know and have known this quote long before I did, but the Japanese poet Matsuo Basho, I remember probably about five or six years ago, I'd liked his haiku, but I had, had never actually gotten one of a book of his, his and realizing that all of them were written on these long journeys he took where he'd have the prose of the hike and then the haiku is like the jewel in that one moment of the hike was just always astonishing to me. And I, I don't know, I just wondered if you ever thought about that when you were hiking or well, that. Well, I, um, I, 
I have a rather large collection of haiku that I have written over the years, oddly enough, and I and I'm a big fan of Basho. I, you know, this the uh, aspiring I'm an aspiring student, um, and um, uh, what's but I but I don't write them on the trail. I, those those are composed at home. Um, I, I it makes me think of a um, a haiku by. Um, um, by Billy Collins, <laughs> which to me was one of the one of the most amusing. It is it is not written in five seven five meter, and it's an, it's his observation about sitting in a um, uh, um, sitting in a, a, a um, at the near Mount or or I guess it was Mount Everest. Or and he he wasn't climbing. He was just in you know it was just far away. But he was sitting in a privy, and looking through the half moon, carved into the door, and seeing Mount Everest through the through the through the moon. <laughs> I that reminds me, and then I'll let other people talk and stop monopolizing time. But there's a there's a Basho poem that is something like um, late night on the way to the out outhouse, I see the white moon flower. Now I always use it with my high school students when they think poetry is too pretty. And I was like, well, what's he doing at midnight? He's a man walking to the outhouse and the moon flower is so beautiful. He has to stop even in that urgency. And that always gets a good laugh in the room. And then they kind of relax a bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think maybe that's what inspired Billy Collins to write. Probably so. Yeah, that makes sense. <clears throat> So Jack, it was really great to hear you read again. Um, and I'm having a recollection that you might be working on another book of poetry or am I imagining that? Well, I, I, no, yeah, it's not, not another book. I'm, I'm you know, collect, collecting some, some other, other poems, but I'm, um, <clears throat> I haven't put them together yet, but you may, getting, you may be getting a call from me in the near future. That'd be fun. <laughs> Um, you know, I, I, I mean, I've been inspired to write about our, our COVID pandemic and um, um, and to just um, try and understand that in a poet through a poetic lens, um, and um, and also more more physics poems. I'm really fascinated by how how cosmology um, and um, it, it becomes becomes metaphor and it, it and we have been down we have been on this road so many times of trying to understand the world and I and I think poetry is another dimension of trying to understand cosmology um, so I'm, I'm I'm hoping to shoehorn some of that stuff into a maybe another collection great sounds like an interesting combination it, it, it's fascinating it's endlessly fascinating it just I mean to bring the, a bit of the pandemic into the cosmology themes <laughs> um, yeah. could be interesting uh, side by side or, or mixed in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, Jack, I uh, enjoyed your poems and stories and observations and thank you very much for sharing them. And thanks. you've talked a little bit about, you know, starting to hike when you were eight in the Catskills with your uncle and, and about being inspired to start writing poetry when you're up in Enosburg Falls uh, by Patience. Can you, uh, and you talked a lot about what poetry means to you. Can you talk a little bit more about how you started with poetry and what it was that inspired you to write poetry as opposed to, opposed to primarily something else or do art or whatever else? Why was it poetry? Yeah. Oh, well, that's, I, I, that's, that's a, an interesting it's a it's an important question um uh and i'm not sure i have a sufficient answer but i'll give it a try i um i i have always enjoyed creative writing not poetry since i was in elementary school um and the and, and as a matter of fact i've i've, I've written a, a, a nonfiction and a historical fiction, and I, I have always thought of that as being my metier in in writing. Um, and I I really wrote the poems um, about my patients as 
um, as a very personal um, effort on my part to try to understand, um, not as a doctor looking at his patients, but to try to understand what was happening in, um, in, in my patients' lives and their, their souls and their emotions and what, what this felt like. And it was initially triggered by a, a baby that was born with a, a, a lethal genetic defect um, called Pina Shokir syndrome. It's very rare. Um, baby lived for um, just about uh, maybe a year and a half, about 18 months. Um, and I made house calls regularly, almost once a week to this family that was really struggling to be able to um, take care of this baby after it was released from the hospital. It was a, a, a highly, it was a technology dependent baby. It had a respirator, it had a, a tracheostomy tube, it needed a lot of care. And these folks, this family took who um, who were were not versed in understanding high tech um, medicine and were were really down to earth Vermont or Vermont family, um, and I so I started going I, you know I was going on a regular basis to this household and witnessing the the just astounding level of love and care um, and. And, and the integration of this dying baby into this large family, this large Vermont family. Um, and I would, there were many times I would just be sitting around having a cup of coffee with, with mom or with dad. And um, there, there was one time I was having, talking with mom and dad was in the, the room next to the baby snoring. And um, it, it was this kind of a dark house. and. Um, but what went on there was was uh, was just magnificent, and I could only capture it in in poetry. And so I I have this very long. It's almost a, it's kind of an epic poem about this child and and the family, and of, of every visit. So and so it was that those repeated visits that um, that uh, led me to to try and capture these feelings in in poetry. I, I did not want to capture them in the, in a straight net, uh, linear narrative. It really needed something more um, more dramatic and more um, more ethereal than I could have in a straight narrative. And I, and once I wrote that, then I was off and running. It was like, oh my goodness, yeah. And and then. <laughs> I have a series of poems that I wrote when I, I used to be the doctor for Job Corps in Virgin. So I, one day a week, I, I'd go to take care of these these really tough kids in Virgins, and um, some of them were were from my neighborhood in the Bronx. So we were, we we had a, a basis for talking with each other, and I, and I found that the, the best way I could understand some of these kids was through poetry. Also, their lives were so complicated and so and often so shattered by by um, by trauma. Um, that it was only through poetry that I could really try to capture um, what what they had experienced and what I was experiencing in response to that. Um, so I, it, it's mysterious, and I, you know, I, um, I I've done some workshops on poetry, but I haven't. I, I'm not a. I haven't. I'm not a student of poetry, although I just took Jay Perini's course on modern modern poetry last year, which was fabulous, and um, I, I should. Um, probably engage in more of more of that didactic learning about poetry. So I, I am a I, I am an unschooled. I am a grandma Moses when it comes to poetry, and um, I am inspired by people like Mary Oliver and Billy Collins and um, Gary Snyder. Um, so thank you, Dr. Mayor. Thank you. Yeah, I think that's our time for tonight, but I really love that as a final story and a final thought about what brought you to poetry and how you felt like poetry was the only way to describe your experience. I just feel like that's a really wonderful definition of poetry. So thank you for that. Yeah. <clears throat> that's Sorry. it for us tonight, everybody, but thank you so much for joining. Yeah. Yeah. I, I see Leif Tillotson here. Leif, are you with this still there? Ask to unmute. I only say that because Leif Tillotson was one of my patients in Enosburg Falls a long, long time ago. I think you're a little older now, Leif, but I'm glad you were able to attend. Great. 